uh, we're going to have Bert Hill, who's uh, actually filling in for Maria Rioja. I didn't make these slides. <laughs> Are they all going to do I hope not. <laughs> but I have to say, this is a talk that was prepared on a Mac using a Microsoft product, and I'm presenting it with a Google product on Linux. So <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, but this, these, so these are slides produced by Maria. And um, this is uh, a, a talk which is an update, basically, of the, the algorithm that she's been uh, presenting at previous project meetings uh, called Meet, which is uh, a technique. Uh, for doing direction-dependent calibration. So this is work that really is led by Maria uh, in collaboration with Richard Dawson, uh, who's also at the University of Western Australia. Uh, some friends and myself have been uh, playing along as well, and now that we have some real images, as you'll see towards the end, um, our work is basically related to verifying the, the quality of the, of the sources in the images that are correct using this technique. Um, so uh, I'll describe, I'll start off by describing this technique. Um, and here I'm basically leaning on the, my, my recollection of the, the talks that Marie has given on this topic in the past. Uh, but then I'll show you some images towards the end that are sort of full, full field of view, um, properly corrected um, images using solutions derived with the delete technique and some initial comparison related to what's called here standard gleam minus dirt calibration, which means basically the, the technique that's been used in the past related to uh, it does a, a measure of direction dependent calibration through shifting um, sources, basically. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in comparison, qualitatively, for the moment. And I'll talk a little bit about bias here at the end. Uh, there is a, um, a paper that describes the technique published last year in monthly notices, um, led by Maria. So you can look there if you want some more details about the technique. So, um, it's just start, this just starts off with a, a zoom in and a, a few different sources um, highlighting the problem that we're aiming to solve here. Um, so you can look in two different directions. You can see circumstances where an individual source, um, either a sequence of two-minute snapshots, where the source is sort of behaving and staying put where it's meant to be, um, from snapshot to snapshot, whereas in other directions or in other fields, uh, you'll see these sources jittering around on the sky, and that's because of ionospheric refraction, uh, which is shifting the source position relative to their nominal position. Um, and worse, uh, the same kind of effect uh, is more commonly, is more often seen at low frequency where the minospheric uh, contribution is worse, more severe. Uh, this is a theme that we'll come back later later on as well. Uh, but you'll see that the deflections are larger at lower frequencies and that they'll come back to, it happens more frequently at lower frequencies as well. Now this is a, a problem if you, if you take multiple snapshots in the same field and you sort of naively add them all up together, then you'll end up with sources smearing out um, or completely de decohering in the worst case. Uh, and so what we'd like to do, and this is because the NWA field of view is so large, much larger than the isoplanetic patch on the sky, um, this is direction dependent. Um, so it needs to be corrected for us in some way. Uh, so this is a, an example of what happens to those directions after doing the, the leap technique that I'll describe in a second. It basically stabilizes the, the locations of the sources, um, keeps them where they're meant to be. So now you can go ahead and stack these snapshots and get a, a deeper image. That's the essence of it. Um, right, and so this is, I think the top right here is going to be um, an example showing the full field where you've got the standard calibration technique um, and then using the deep calibration, it, it removes the, the artifacts um, associated with the, the bright source. Um, so um, yeah, and I think it's not presented on this slide, but uh, there's, yes, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'm just trying to remember what's coming in this particular slide. So the way that LEAP works, um, there are multiple okay, there are multiple ways to do direction dependent calibration. There's feeling techniques, and there's, there's various different ways that people have explored, um, and, and they work in you know the various degrees, and they have various degrees of computational efficiency. Um, the way that LEAP works um, is by doing some pretty strong uh, frequency averaging um, in order to produce bandwidth smearing that removes the contributions, or at least largely removes the contributions from field sources so that you're left with only the bright source of the phase hunter. So what you do is phase shift to the position of a known source, bright source, uh, and then frequency average so that you 
smear all these sources out, and they're left with just this one, at which point you can calibrate it, and you have a game solution in that direction. This only works as well as the, as the bandwidth smearing works in rejecting the other sources, of course. And one of the things that Maria likes to point out is that now that we've moved to phase two, we have longer baselines, and the frequency smearing is now more effective, which actually you know, is good, both because it's more effective, and it also gives you more flexibility in how you do the frequency averaging as well. Um, the other great point about this is that you only have to know where the bright sources are in the sky, and we already know that from Gleam. Um, and so otherwise, because there's no information going into this technique about what other sources are in the sky, um, you can actually do multiple of these directions all at the same time. And so it's what Maria refers to as embarrassingly parallel. Because you just pick 200 sources, say, um, and you just have, uh, phase shift and average them all simultaneously, which makes it a very efficient technique for separating out the source directions. Um, yes, so here's the embarrassing, the embarrassing parallel point there. Because it only uses the sky model to understand where it should be looking for, for a game solution. Um, yes, so longer baselines, as I said, result in, in increased efficiency of the directional filter, which means the bandpass engineering, uh, the bandwidth engineering part, and therefore a, a better direction of kind calibration as well. Okay, um, so the point that, that she was making here is that I mentioned the ionospheric refraction already, but what we're seeing increasingly now with the phase two data is because we have the longer baselines again, is that you start to see curvature in the in the uh, phase screen as well, um, which is um, a higher order effect, which also causes um, defocusing as well, and that won't be corrected by just sort of moving source positions around on the sky. You have to take the, the curvature of the of the phase screen into account uh, in order to. To, uh, to gain the source flux back um, that has been to your land. Uh, right, so it's embarrassingly parallel. Um, now, the, the part that we use now, the, the development that's been made most recently, is in taking the direction dependent solutions that come from the and feeding these into wide field imagers uh, to do um, basically you know, a direction dependent uh, correction in the image, imaging step. So, we've been using, most recently, we've been using WS Clean, the most recent version. Because it does um, this kind of correction if you give it what's called a text screen, so a model of the ionospheric electron content. It also takes into account the MWAB. Um, so this is a very, a very good technique for us to take care of the direction of pendant effects as, as well as the beam uh, at the same time. We've also experimented with um, DD Facet as well, which is a, uh, an imaging program that was developed for LOFAR and is being used very effectively for um, the LOFAR all sky survey. Uh, but it's a bit more hard to use, and WS Clean is in the public domain, so we've been using that most recently. Um, okay, what's next? Scalable for longer baselines, true, because of the, the point that I made before about um, it being a better directional filter. Uh, and you get these phase screens out as a, as, a, um, as, a direct, as a direct result. And you'll see a few more of these, but um, you know, the, the simplest case is that you'll have sort of a, a, a linear gradient of phase across the across the, the field of view, and that's just a, a, a shift of the source position, uh, whereas ones that have curvature, if it looks like a Pringle, that means that you're also getting defocusing as well. Do you have a question, Jeff? Yeah. I guess I should say that, you know, when I showed the, this, this image here, in the technique there's actually no imaging at this stage, because it's really just an invisibility. So it's way before decomposition. Okay. Uh, that's only, this, this image is only for illustration purposes, yeah, basically, yeah. just to show what's happening in the visual. Okay, I'll just speed up a little bit. Uh, actually, near the end, this is just where I show some pretty pictures now. So um, this is showing, now having applied the, the calibration techniques, developed the calibration solutions, and put them through WS3 with the images. Um, so this is um, a 150 megahertz image. A few minutes snapshot um, before and after the, the leak technique. Now you see one source basically improving, um, but there's actually direction kind of techniques across the field of view here. It's doing multiple multiple directions. Um, I think it's 200, about 200. Yeah. So there's a, a there's a subtlety here, and I don't understand all the details to be honest with you. But basically, there's 200 candidate sources that go in as calibrators, and then during the process, there's some filtering that takes place depending on the quality of the solutions that come out. But some get rejected. At least 150, I think, um, on the basis of 200 that went into the, into the second. That's 
Some memories you can check with Maria. Um, <clears throat> and so a good question is, you know, whether that density is sufficient. And for the moment, it seems to be sufficient, but this is why we're doing the, the very detailed test now to look at the field sources and make sure that the, there's no gaps in the cover. It depends on the field, right? It does. Yeah. You look at it like they do with the UV facet, where you actually see the parts of the sky that the source is fixing, and then you to see Not directly. I'll come back to that later on. Yeah. We can talk about that later. Um, okay, so one of the things that um, Ray is pointing out here is that you actually get, um, across the field of view, you actually get an improvement in the uh, in the source brightness. So there's overall a 5% um, flux recovery for all the sources. This is for all the calibrator sources. And so the stuff that Tom, Franz, and I are looking at now is what the, is how that looks for the, for the field sources in between the calibrator sources, and I think this directly addresses your question. Okay, um, so just zooming in on a couple of directions here. Um, this is one, uh, and oh yeah, and this is a, one of the nights that's um, regarded as severe weather at the moment from Green, um, corrected with wheat, and then in comparison with a good weather night. Um, so you can see that the image quality that comes out is comparable to the good weather night, so you've sort of recovered the, the imaging there. Now this isn't to say that, you know, the, the, the strategy of reobserving a field in bad nights is, is, is not useful, it is, but, you know, say you had a transient source or something in this field of view, then you would, you would not have to lose this talk. Um, okay, so this is just making the point about the phase screen being linear in the good weather case and curved in the severe weather case, which gives you this defocusing effect and the strong image artifacts as well for the direction. Uh, just another direction. Um, it's a fainter source, but you can see if there's some artifacts around that source, which are now gone after the comparable again to the good weather case, and the same again for a third example. I think in this case, um, Maria's pointing out that there's, I don't know if you can see them, but there's strikes going across here. That's from this artifact from some other bright source, which have been corrected uh, in the location of this other source. Because it's fully, you know, simultaneously direction sensitive. Um, okay, the last point is that at 80 megahertz, the key focusing effect is always present for phase two. As far as we can tell. So for the for 150 megahertz, it's like 25% of the time where you have to do this um, and, and you would be correcting for defocusing. But at 80 megahertz, it seems to be um, always the case that uh, there's defocusing. So just to point out that you know this technique seems to be useful if you really needed a particular epoch and reabsorbing would not be suitable. And probably always it is required for the lowest frequency. And here is the, the flux recovery is in fact a bit more than 5%, and this is a good weather night. Okay, so you can also get, um, you know, atmospheric information out of all of this. Um, these are um, source offset uh, plots, very similar to the ones that you will have seen from uh, talks about the, um, the, uh, the um, direction setting correction technique that is already used for, uh, for green and other imaging uh, applications. Um, but the point here is that there's information on fine angular scales from the um, from the phase screens themselves, as well as the large angular scales from the um, information between sources across the whole field of view. Okay, so just by, by way of summary, um, the um, the direction dependent effect seems to be very um, strong uh, in phase two, uh, particularly at the lowest frequency, um, showing this defocusing as well as uh, source shift. Um, but again, because of phase two having longer baselines, this technique seems to work even better than it did with phase one. Uh, we're now doing a lot of testing on implementing these corrections in WF Clean in a fully direction appended way along with the beam. Uh, and that seems to be going well. There's quantitative uh, tests going on right now, as I mentioned, which will show um, at the next project meeting for sure. Uh, and they're working on a, uh, this is work that really is being done by Richard and, and Maria at UWA um, to convert this into a, um, a parallel publication. Um, and you can contact them to, to use it um, as it stands now in its sort of development form. So I believe that's all. I'll try to answer any questions now.